students are critical contributors to the core business of a university and therefore should be continuously supported. So we organize these sessions to provide academics with a platform for discussions and engagement with the view of modeling and sharing insights on different strategies that could improve teaching and learning, particularly as we continue to be in the midst of COVID-19 that forces us to engage in remote teaching. Today's session is titled Empowerment for Teaching Excellence through Virtuous Agency and will be presented by Professor Henny Lotter, who is an established professor of philosophy here at UJ, who has published many articles in different types of publications, such as journals, books, conference proceedings, and so forth. His research interests include justice, human dignity, poverty, and environment, environmental ethics. He has delivered over 20 dialogues and debates on teaching excellence on var at various platforms or forums at UJ. Uh, the title of today's session was actually inspired by a book that Prof. Lotta has recently published. The title of the book is Empowerment for Teaching Excellence Through Virtuous Agency. Uh, without just without going too much into the details of the book, I'm just going to give you like a few hints on what the book is about. It offers new ways of thinking about teaching excellence in higher education, as well as provides a fresh interpretation of Boyer's famous account of scholarship as the foundation of university teaching. It then gives an account of the various dimensions of the domain of university teaching and the core drivers required to bring those domains to life. Uh, Prof. Lotta in the book argues that university lecturers aspiring to become excellent should be active agents, strongly pursuing the development of their perfectible abilities required for high quality teaching. So in this session, Prof. Lotta is going to present the idea of scholarship as offered by Boyer. He will outline the core aspects of university teaching that demand attention in the quest for excellence in teaching. He will demonstrate the role of agency and skills development in the development of teaching excellence. He will then present ideas drawn from virtue, epistemology as fundamental drivers to become excellent at university teaching. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to hand over to Professor Lotter. Prof. Lotter. Thank you very much, Ms. Mahabane. Um, good morning, colleagues, welcome. Let me share my screen um, and then we can get going. So I hope you can all see my screen. Yes, we can see it, Prof. Okay, thank you so much. So colleagues, um, let me start. by saying, first of all, that I'm quite aware that my talk might be abstract at times. I'm a philosopher. So therefore, I invite you to please ask questions or make comments at any time during my talk. Use the chat box or raise your hand function. If I miss um, a comment in or question in the chat box or raise your hand, Ms. Mahabane, perhaps you can just alert me then. Okay. So first of all, thank you to um, for asking me, Ms. Mahabani, and your colleagues to present a snapshot of the contents of the short book of mine that I published in September. Um, it's, it's a kind of shortish book, just 48,000 words, but it gives me um, the opportunity to present you what I call a teaser. So a teaser is a short introductory advertisement for a product that stimulates interest by remaining cryptic. So, so I can give you some kind of idea of the main argument, um, but a lot will be unsaid. Hopefully you will be interested enough to read the book. Now, I first want to ask your permission. If you're not going to give it, then I'm really in trouble. 
But may I compare you as a lecturer to a marathon athlete? Why do I want to do that? For me, this comparison will focus your attention on the most important factors involved in becoming excellent at teaching. So in a sense, I'm saying to you, um, in your work as a lecturer at a university, um, there are important overlaps, parallels, and analogies between a high between your work uh, and your attempt to become excellent and what a marathon athlete tries to do. It will all also give me the opportunity to show the central argument of the book. So that's a picture I am reasonably sure that taken at the most recent Olympics. And you can see the, the um, athletes uh, running in their national colors, Kenyan athlete, Tanzania, etc. And these are the world's excellent marathon runners, the best of the best. So the professional marathon athlete aiming at excellence must do the following things. First of all, must strive to become the ideal version of a marathon athlete. And we'll talk about that just now. They have a specific task to complete. They must have a particular kind of body. You can see uh, all of them have got similar build uh, and they've got similar looks when you look at them quickly to the kinds of bodies that they have. They must have a specific set of abilities and they must have characteristics and a mindset that function as the enablers for them to be excellent at what they're doing. So to make this comparison work, let's first explore the marathon athlete. So the professional marathon athlete striving for excellence is one that, let me just, okay. This athlete must aim to become the ideal version of a marathon athlete. And let me uh, give you some idea. They must have an economy of effort. They can't waste effort. They must have evenness of effort to be able to run fluently for 42 kilometers. They must be able to conquer the so-called wall. Those of you who are marathon athletes will know that at a certain point in a marathon, you strike what they call a wall. And that's where your body struggles to provide you with enough energy. They must be able to conquer that wall. They must prepare for uh, through consistent, well-planned training. They must have high levels of VO2 max. That is the ability of their bodies to take in, absorb oxygen and to use it to provide them with energy. And they must have the perfect marathon build. So they have a specific task to complete as described by the rules of the International Athletics uh, Association, 42.195 kilometers of a demanding course on the road, not on soft ground. And those of you who know the history will know where it comes from, from ancient Greece, the length of the marathon. And they must have a particular kind of body. It's a small body, it's light, it's lean, low body fat, 5%, uh, typical, a uh, world-class sprinter would have 10% body fat, normal humans like us, 15% or more. Then the marathon athlete must have a specific set of abilities. They must be able uh, to endure uh, over a long distance. They must be able to resi resist fatigue. They must be able to tolerate pain. They must have this even economic running style. They must be mentally tough and they must have a high ability to absorb oxygen. In addition, they must have the characteristics and the mindset that function as enablers to, to deliver that top performance when it counts in a competition that is important. So they must have a vision of the end goal. They must be able to focus. They must be highly motivated. They must be resilient. They must be tenacious. They must be self-confident. They must have a deep, unwavering belief in their abilities and potential. And they must have 
calmness. So that's the profile of the professional marathon athlete, athlete that falls in the class of excellent marathon athletes. So what is this excellence that the professional marathon athlete is aiming at? Let me try to explain. So someone said excellence is nothing in itself. It is only the measurement of something else. So what is this something else that excellence measures in the case of the marathon athlete? First of all, we must agree about the character and the worth of the relevant activity. So we must have a definition of exactly what is the task of this activity. It's 42.195 kilometers over a specific kind of terrain. And why is it valuable to do that, to test people's abilities in running that distance? We must be able to judge how far any one instance embodies more of that worth. So we must be able to judge what is a better performance than the rest. In the process of measuring that, we are measuring a specific set of actions, skills, and performances, and we use tailor-made standards to measure that. So excellence means, in the case of a marathon athlete, the ideal marathon athlete who produces an excellent performance, embody the characteristics of a marathon runner and exemplify the values of a marathon runner to the highest degree possible. So that athlete performs at the upper limit of a scale and has features that stand out from the rest. So how does this idea of excellence apply to your teaching? In my judgment, all of these criteria are relevant to your teaching as well. So let me go through them again. So excellence is the measurement of something else. It's the measurement of the quality of your teaching. In order to be excellent at teaching, we must agree about the character and the worth of the relevant activity. So what is the character of university level teaching and what is the worth of university level teaching. Secondly, we must be able to judge how far any one instance embodies more of that worth. So we must have measurements in place to judge that this particular candidate is worthy of the Vice Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching. We believe we can judge that. In the process, we are measuring a very specific set of actions, skills, and performances, and we use a specific set of standards appropriate to teaching at university level. So if you're excellent at teaching, it means you embody characteristics and you exemplify values of university teaching to the highest degree possible, and your performance is at the upper limit on a scale. You have features in your teaching that stand out from the rest. So that, that would be my understanding of what excellence in the context of teaching would mean. And it's going to take me the whole rest of my talk to explain that to you in much more detail. So, one thing that a lot of researchers say is that a shared understanding of teaching excellence to get to that is an incredibly difficult task. And you must just look at the applications for teaching awards and see how difficult it is to make out which one is really the best, the outstanding uh, lecture. Why is that so? Because university level teaching is a complex matter, it's multifaceted and it's contextually dependent. So how different could it be to teach philosophy, to teach mathematics, to teach geology, to teach zoology where you study living animals, botany where you study plants, economics where you study economic systems, or where you study teaching. So, so it's a lot of excellence is dependent on what you do in that context. 
So excellence in teaching just simply means that your university level teaching has been developed to the highest degree humanly possible. So what about you as a university lecturer? We've looked at the marathon athlete and what are the requirements for marathon athlete to become excellent in marathon running in long distance athletics. What are the factors to look at to understand how you can become excellent at teaching? Let me try to explain this to you. So we said the marathon athlete aims to be the ideal long distance runner over 42 kilometers, has a specific task to complete that specific distance on a road, not to soft the surface, has a particular body, small, lean, low body fat, high oxygen processing capacity, has a specific set of abilities, pain tolerant, fatigue resistant, etc and have certain mental makeup, certain characteristics as enablers to perform on the day and to be able to do their best. And you, as a professional lecturer, well, you must aim to be the ideal academic. And I'll tell you what I think the ideal academic looks like. You have a specific task to complete. And I'll try to spell out for you what your task involves. You must have a particular mind. And add it, you must have bodily health as well. That is quite important, but your mind is more important in this case. And I'll explain to you the kind of mind that you need. You must have a specific set of abilities that you can train and educate and perfect. And I'll say something about that as well. And then what I think is the crucial part, you must have specific characteristics as enablers for you to work towards becoming excellent at teaching. So let me now unpack your profile for high performance in more detail. Let me just pause a bit and ask anybody with a comment or question at this point. Okay. So let's have a look now first. As a professional lecturer, you must aim to become the ideal version of the university academic, capable of raising a new generation of academics and professionals. That is your job, and that is what you've got to do. So what is my vision of the ideal academic? My vision is the version given by Boyer. He's a highly influential American education specialist, and in the early 90s, he, in a few pages, he wrote this wonderful vision of the four functions of scholarship that overlap and reinforce one another. And for me, that's the best possible description of what our job involves. First thing, he says, you must engage in the scholarship of discovery. And what does that mean? You investigate various things using the best possible intellectual tools. Your aim is to get knowledge that matters. And you are trying to explain various things that we don't understand well enough. And you are trying to secure our survival and our flourishing in better ways than we currently do. So that's the first function, the scholarship of discovery. The second one, because Boyer was quite aware that in your attempts to engage in scholarship of discovery, you might become narrowly focused on specific issues. Therefore, he said, you must also engage in the scholarship of integration. That means you must be able to synthesize your findings, your research. You must find interconnections between your work 
and other people's work, between your discipline and other people's disciplines. You must be able to, to uh, place your work in larger contexts and to see the links with other disciplines. So that's the second function. The third one is the scholarship of application. And he says, you must work on problems that he calls cons some consequential problems, problems that affect us. And you must listen to feedback by stakeholders in your kind of, of research area and saying that theory and practice vitally interact one renews the other. So you've got to engage in that kind of scholarship as well. The fourth kind of scholarship is a scholarship of teaching. And he says teaching for him means building bridges between the teacher's understanding and the student's learning. And it's got to be this kind of dialogue, this conversation, this interaction between lecturer and student where the students can interact and also teach the, the professors new, new ways of thinking, asking them difficult, tough questions in that dialogue uh, that occurs in teaching. And obviously, as you will know, if you just uh, look at your colleagues around you, that the way that individual academics weight the various functions might differ. Some might focus more on discovery, some more on teaching, someone more on integration, the other one more on application. But for me, that is the vision of an ideal academic. In, in a sense, it also encapsulates for me this vision, what, we sh what the kind of student that we should produce that we can send into the world to make a difference, to use all these various skills to enrich human life uh, and to enrich uh, research uh, teaching at university. So as a professional lecturer, you have a specific task. So let's, let's look at the second dimension you must teach at university level. So what does university level teaching mean? Now I'm saying this is quite a complex task that has a domain and that has drivers. Let me explain that. So the domain of your teaching is first of all, you must have a specific kind of training and education. You get appointed if you have uh, proper qualifications and hopefully a bit of experience as well. And, and for those of you who've been appointed long time ago and done all your degrees, etc., the way that you educate yourself more um, through your research, through your scholarship of teaching and learning uh, counts in this domain. That's part of this uh, one dimension of this domain. Secondly, the domain is you've got to select course contents so you must be able from the complexity of your uh, discipline of the field that you're working in you must be able to select what must i give students to introduce them to this field to introduce them to this topic um, what is appropriate that will give them entry into that field give them understanding obviously you must be able to set learning outcomes, and you must be able to assess whether the students reach the learning objectives that you have formulated. And you must be aware of different styles of assessment, what is most appropriate in this case, what kind of skills, etc., will you foster when you use this kind of assessment. You must be able to construct syllabi. You must be able to uh, develop a sequence, design a sequence of events. You must set out the course contents. You must set out the assessments. You must set out the meetings. You must have venues and have dates for everything, etc. So a kind of a contract of what is going to happen in this term course, in this semester course. And as a university lecturer, you must be aware of the best instructional methods 
by which you teach the things that you are responsible for. So what is the best ways of teaching mathematics, geology, political science, fashion design, uh, engineering, etc.? So that's the domain. The drive is the things that bring the domain to life, that set it in act, that set that the things that set it in action. First is you must be, be able to plan because you must plan in detail what exactly is going to happen in every week, what the students must do, what are you going to do, what is happening in your tutorial program, etc. And then as the course unfolds, you must manage, you must ensure that the right things happen at the right time, if there are setbacks, if there are problems, if there are things not working, you must be able to take corrective action so that you still realize your fundamental course goals. A core thing in your teaching task is to develop students, is to help them grow into the kind of scholarship that I've uh, shown you earlier. Uh, you must ensure that they develop skills and insight and knowledge and virtues that will equip them to become good citizens and to become good at the careers that they'll choose. Something that's, that's similar but not the same is, is you must have the ability to challenge students, to stretch them, to, to confront their beliefs, their ideas, their ways of thinking, and to, to get them to think anew about these things, to be willing to change their ways of thinking, their ways of doing. A further driver of teaching is to get students to become part of a community of practice, a group of interdependent scholars at different levels of seniority from your new participants in your first year up to your experienced participants uh, at higher levels of, of appointment uh, through your postgrad students who are more experienced and, and to have this interdependent community where people support one another, challenge one another, talk to one another. Very important as well is to be able to provide students with appropriate support. They often need support, they need the interest of lectures um, and to be able to identify students in need of support and to identify the right kinds of support is a crucial driver of teaching. Last but not least, strong emphasis in the literature, feedback for reflection. So as a lecturer, you must be able to solicit feedback from yourself. You must be aware of your teaching uh, in the lecture afterwards, make notes, note what's working, what's not working, note, what, note what's going wrong, note what's, what's really uh, uh, effective and get that kind of feedback from your students, from your colleagues, from educational specialists, from colleagues in your discipline, from, from outside your university, from uh, professional organizations. And this, these various dimensions of the task of university level teaching form the basis for measures to track your teaching performance. Okay. Any comments or questions from your side? Let me see. Clark, there's, a, there's a comment. Oh, let me see. From Quit. UK. She says, any reason to prefer or select Boyer rather than Bloom or Solo? Your view on their difference? The... Let me let me give you my, my comment there. I... I had, I had a limited space to, to write this book because it's within a specific series that publish um, very specific uh, length of books. Let me just go back to that slide. So the, the, the choice for Boyer was, I, I had a choice. So, so how do I accurately describe depict what university teachers do, because this book is about university teaching, not other forms of teaching. 
and the the I could have uh, gone the route of trying to describe the functions of universities. And that for me is a minefield and there's a complex literature. So in my mind, uh, Boyer describes accurately the functions of research, uh, teaching, community service, but he describes it in quite a nuanced way. So for me, that's the reason why I chose Boyer's view on scholarship. You will note in the book, I don't think it is, it is in the um, in the presentation that that I refer to to it somewhere in the book that there's almost a perfect overlap between the various aspects of the four functions of scholarship and Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, it 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 is as if you could fuse those two views and bring them together. So that that justifies my choice. Okay. Now I want to focus on a different dimension of the task that university lecturers um, have, and that is that this complex task has a focus point interaction. Just by way of an aside comment, um, close to the publication date of the book, I realized there's something bothering me, that there's something that I must add. I must add this point about interaction, and that became a, a full-length chapter in the book, wrote it right at the end, um, because many lecturers, perhaps many of you, will say in response to, um, for example, the advertisement for, for the Teaching Excellence Awards or any te Teaching Excellence Awards at UJ or in your faculty or wherever, that, that you don't understand the emphasis on all these other things than your competence in the lecture hall. And for this reason, I had to address this issue to talk about the various ways and levels of interaction between university lecturers and students. So students and lecturers interact in physical spaces. Now, we might have forgotten a bit now that fails uh, during the pandemic, but usually it's it's in a lecture hall, in a um, seminar room, in office spaces, in the passages, in front front of lecture halls, etc. So so that's one part of your task that has a specific set of requirements. Can you interact properly with students in a seminar room? Can you interact? effectively with a 600 group of students in a large lecture hall. The second uh, focus point of interaction is textual spaces. So you design a study guide, um, you give students notes, uh, you draft uh, exam paper or test paper, so you interact with them in textual spaces, they write, write you an essay, they uh, complete a test paper, they send you messages, etc. Third space where we interact, and all these spaces of interaction uh, you must be good at to be excellent in your teaching. Those are the virtual spaces, whether it's whatever kind of social media or learning technology uh, that all of us had to learn very quickly and effectively over the last 18 months. Then a different uh, concept to use is synchronous interaction. Both of you are there at the same time, whichever forms of, of space you are in, asynchronous. Huh? Prof, is it me or Prof has frozen? He seems to have frozen. Am I back? Yes, you're back, Prof. 
looks okay. I don't know what happened there, but I was thrown out for a moment. Okay. So I don't know where I lost you, but um, last thing that I've been saying is that there are these different forms of communication, and for me. We lost you, Prof. Maybe you should switch off your camera. Okay, I'm back again. Maybe try to maybe switch off your camera if it's a network issue. Let me switch it off. Okay. Okay, can you see again? Yes, we can see the presentation. We can hear you. Okay, so this issue of not being able to see the students, um, let me just add this. One, one of the one of the books that I that I read, uh, two of the books that I read, uh, both published in 2021. Um, in the one case, the it's a book written by by prominent uh, education specialists who have got wise things to say about teaching excellence, and they they say that they they wrote this book how to make the transition to online teaching and learning. And the first thing that they say is, you will be struck by the, the impact of not being able to see your students. And in another book that, that gives a brilliant uh, analysis of the live lecture and why it's important, this uh, academic says, um, just to enter a lecture is a special event because that, that space is reserved for uh, lecture and students to set aside time to discuss these important things that we think are worth of study. So let's just look at the interaction in the live lecture. So the live lecture is this, the, the event in teaching that many lecturers believe, if you want to see my qualities, look at me interacting with my students. It's a human to human contact. And there's a, there's a story about one of the famous uh, 20th century philosophers, Michel Foucault, who gave his inaugural lecture. And apparently the, the venue went dark and he couldn't see the audience. And he found that so immensely upsetting because it makes the point that we are not actors on a stage playing to an audience, pretending that we are other characters than who we really are. We are uh, human lecturers, and part of our presentation is to show who we are as scholars. So I had quite fun in writing this part of the book. Um, it, it came last, as I said, but what I did was to play with various analogies. Some, some are in the literature, some not. So there's a question, is the live lecture a performance? And one of the, the researchers says, be careful in how you use performance. You are not an actor or a musician entertaining people. They might do more than entertain as well. They might also challenge you or, or comfort you or give you pleasure or whatever. But the kind of performance, that is one sense of the word performance. The other sense is, as you would say to someone, I've got to perform now. I've got to do a series of activities uh, at my best. And that is the sense in which teaching and learning is a performance you must carry out a set of activities uh, at the best of your ability with a focus on teaching and learning. The, one can draw many parallels between actors in a theater and a lecture hall, a lecture and students. 
but there are many dissimilarities as well. I refer to the crucial one just now. As a lecturer, you must role model your scholarship, the kind of scholar that you are in this specific field. You are playing the role, if you wish, but you are playing yourself as a scholar. In the theatre, the audience and the actors know they are pretending to be other people whose story they are telling us. A fascinating analogy is the jazz analogy, where uh, two researchers made the point, lecturing live is like being in a jazz performance. One of the members of the jazz band might take a new line of music, introduce a new theme, and that might disturb the, the way that the performance is going and you as the other members of the band must synchronize again, must fall in with that person and reach a new form of harmonization with that musician, making the point how one student's question or remark can change the direction of, of a live lecture and how you must be able to respond appropriately. A ballet dancer and choreographer turned philosopher wrote about the similarities between choreography and teaching the live lecture, saying, well, you've got to design a series of uh, teaching and learning interactions in the live lecture. What is going to happen? How are you going to use your voice? How are you going to use your text? How are you going to use your, your uh, presentation? What role are you going to give the students? What learning activities do you want to build into it? Someone else in an older um, article in the early 80s said, as the lecturer in a live lecture, you must be like the conductor of an uh, orchestra. You must be able to listen to all the different instruments, all the different voices in the class. And you must be able to bring in all those voices, not let some dominate and to have a flowing discussion and debate. One that, that I particularly enjoyed because it's one that I created myself is to see the analogies between rock climbing and lecturing live. So people who do rock climbing plan their climb. They plan exactly how they're going to go from which rock to which one, where can they find places to grip, etc., so they don't fall off. And the point that this uh, academic made, this researcher made, is to say that we don't just plan before the climb. We must also plan whilst climbing and calls that an active planning. So as a lecturer, during a live lecture, you must have the ability to judge what is going on here. Is this lecture working? Do the students understand? Must I change direction? Must I abandon my plans for the rest of the lecture and develop a new plan? Must I make that intervention or that intervention? Then this research also says we must also do uh, post-active uh, planning. We must debrief, as it were, at the end, which goes back to uh, reflexive thinking about your teaching. A common analogy used by many people, and many people would say, I teach in a Socratic style. And I just ask myself, isn't this a case of an analogy that has become too well worn. It's, it's, it's not effective as an analogy anymore. And I looked at the way that, that Plato talks about the Socratic dialogue. The function of the dialogue, it's a dialogue that, a never ending dialogue with a specific function to talk about what is the good life? How do we live the good life? 
and we never stop engaging in that dialogue. That is not exactly the function of dialogue in many, many different disciplines. So somehow it's a dialogue where lecturer and student, if you use it as an analogy, where lecturer and student engage as participants and lecture as well. I'm also willing to be questioned. I'm also willing to listen to what you're saying and to take you seriously, et cetera, and to learn from students as well. So the, the Socratic uh, dialogue adapted to teaching at university level would have those um, kind of, of characteristics where you become the advocate for a specific position, I'm trying to convince you to see it this way. And all participants also becoming judges. Is that an effective way of trying to convince me? The chapter that I wrote that this slide tried to summarize uh, is actually called Teaching Excellence as an Achievement. And the idea of achievement, what does it mean that it's an achievement? Usually we see something as an achievement if it's something that's not easy to do. So if you want to do everything that I've discussed in the last two slides in the best way possible, for you as the class of university lectures, that will be difficult to do everything at the high level of highest quality possible. That's the one thing. Uh, it requires a lot of effort. That's one dimension of what an achievement is. The other dimension is an achievement is something that comes from the fact that you know what you're doing. It's not because of luck. If you walk in the forest and you discover a pot of gold and you become a millionaire, that's not an achievement because you got that gold through sheer luck, not through what is called competent causation. It's not you that caused it through your know-how, your knowledge. Okay. So now we've looked at the ideal uh, academic. We've looked at the task. Let's look at the particular kind of mind that you need and physical health. I'm not going to touch on that, but all of you will know that to protect your physical health is key to high performance in your intellectual work. I'm not going to touch on this part, but you know that to be able to do what you're doing, you had to get the qualifications, you had to write the publications, you had to develop the portfolios, teaching, etc. But what I want to focus on is to grow into being the agent of your own teaching. So this is at the heart of becoming excellent. Because teaching is under our control and we can do it at higher or lower, lower levels of quality. So let me just, just distinction between an agent and a patient. Agent is something or someone that exerts power, produces an effect, causes an outcome, or influences its environment. So <clears throat> some of you will remember the washing powder. Uh, advert that talked about a powerful agent in that washing, washing power to take away um, stains, etc. But we're now talking about you as university lecturer. A patient is someone who cannot act independently or autonomously. There are many things you cannot do for yourself, even if you would want to. But then you also get people who live like patients. They don't want to act independently or autonomously. And you will know the stereotype. Some university lectures of 
particularly active agents, always changing things, always doing new things, uh, always um, just lots of new activities uh, or just lots of activities for their students. And those, hopefully you haven't encountered them, I have in, in my life, those who taught the same, the same curriculum, use the same notes for decades. They patience. Just a few words about agency. So it's a variable. So I could be a high-level agent, or I could be a low-level patient, but it could also vary during my life. I could be engaged in a major research project, and I might become more of a patient in my teaching. So it's not a constant, it shifts on a spectrum. It can be measured. Uh, you can note, you yourself, how active you are or not. We are interdependent social agents embedded within communities. So you are influenced by your community, whether it's the community of practice in your department, in your discipline, in your faculty, or whether you have a group of colleagues, like-minded colleagues that you share ideas with, but definitely you're also influenced by the social, social structures and practices that constrain you or might enrich you. So you work at UJ. UJ has a teaching policy. Um, UJ has got many, many policies affecting teaching got many practices affecting teaching, got various forms of support, et cetera. So you are also influenced in what you can become as a university lecturer by your environment. So in any form of sport, the sport's been designed to test and celebrate a particular combination of skills, abilities, and capacities. It's no different in teaching. So excellent teaching requires us to develop a very specific, comprehensive set of skills. So you must have a specific set of abilities, and I call them empowerable abilities that can be perfected. So I'll explain to you what they are, but these are abilities that you can strengthen, that you can improve, that you can train and educate. So let's just look at our abilities. We've got cognitive faculties, vision, hearing, touch, taste, memory, reason. We've got talents, so-called gifts, natural endowments, excellences of faculties. And they enable us to be good at problem solving, pattern recognition, mathematical thinking, artistic creativity, linguistic expression. And that's why many of us are in the departments and in the fields that we are, because we've got special talents to be good at those things that count in that specific discipline. Then we have temperaments, states of mind, that comprise our mental, mental constitution. They're expressed by means of attitudes and judgments. For example, you can be open-minded. And then skills, particular abilities to perform specific tasks. And I'm claiming, and that's the core point of my book, I think, that all these things can be focused, guided, developed, and driven by what I call virtues. So how do we perfect our abilities? We cultivate them through repetition and practice. So we develop specific competencies through repeated performance, like the athlete, like the gymnast, like the guitar player, uh, we develop them through repeated performance. And this is very important 
because this is what is called deliberate practice. You require evaluative feedback to be integrated for improving. Otherwise, you're practicing in a mindless way. You Okay, am I back? Yes, you are. Okay. So through this kind of deliberate practice, you can learn to execute such skills at the highest level, like other high-performing people, whether it's guitar players or whatever. So you become an expert through the development of a greater sensitivity to the relevant factors in your domain. So you get more knowledge of what is relevant. You get more knowledge of teaching and learning what, what you should look out for, and you develop greater problem solving abilities. So what you do is you activate your agency, you set goals, you are motivated, and you strive by making decisions um, through your will, using your will. And to become expert, you do so through the refinement of skills that require forms of deliberate practice. And many of you will know Vygotsky's idea that you always work in that area of proximal development where you almost can do it. And through uh, the right kind of practice, you can learn to do new things. One very interesting thing that I also discussed discovered right at the end, um, just before I submitted the final manuscript, was the idea of expert intuition. And that is, if you train your skills in the right kind of way, you can develop what is called smart skills, flexible skills, adaptable, adaptable skills, and then skills that you can instantly apply, an insight that will immediately come to mind. So you lecturing in your live lecture, student asks you a question that is not directly linked to the course contents, but it takes you somewhere else. And you just know immediately how to handle that because you have a set of expert skills, expert insight, and you can adapt, you can respond immediately to that kind of, of question, comment, or behavior. The, it, it's, it's, in a sense, to give you some kind of idea. Let's say you try to learn to play the piano and you learn to play one melody. You can play nothing else. The person who has done years of training and did a lot of skills training in piano and got a lot of feedback and, and had a good teacher who showed the student how to correct skills. That person's got a set of skills. That person will say to you, give me that uh, sheet music. I can play that song. Some people can play it even uh, by ear. Oh, I've heard that melody and they can play that. And that's, that's the importance of developing what I call smart skills. So this is the last part of my presentation. That is, you must have the characteristics that function as enablers. You must have a mindset, or if you wish, an intellectual or epistemic character with teaching virtues. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with virtue theory. It comes from Aristotle was used throughout history and then kind of lost, rediscovered in the 20th century, now highly influential. So a virtue is a certain trait or quality or characteristic of your character, of you as a person. There are certain inclinations or tendencies 
that you want to do certain things and they can guide your action. So they determine many of your beings and doings. If you are conscientious, then it will guide you to do everything assigned to you in the best way possible to try to take care of all the details of a project you have to deliver. So how do we determine what kind of virtues we need for teaching? And this is kind of a complex debate, but let me give you some kind of idea. We ask, what kind of activity is this? So we've said this is university level teaching and the task looks like that. What are the end goals? Uh, let's say you, you set Bloom's taxonomy as the end goals. So what kind of virtues do you need to be able to, you yourself, function at all Bloom's levels, but to teach your students to function there as well? You could ask what are the core goods of the practice? I try to say to you, I prefer um, <clears throat> Boyer's version of the various functions of scholarship. And then what is it, does it mean to flourish in university teaching? What does it mean for students to flourish? What kind of character traits must you have in order to produce that? Before I give you my list, let's just talk about how we acquire them. We must nurture them, we must cultivate them. We cultivate them through habituation. That is, we just try to be honest in everything if we're not honest at the moment. Try to be honest, try to be honest in every situation and gradually by making it into a habit that will become part of your character. Very important thing is we emulate, we receive feedback and we correct. So I want to be like that professor. That professor really demonstrates to me what an academic should be like, what an engineer should be like, how an engineer would think. So you get educated to know what these virtues are, to know what, what the right kind of things would be to do as an engineer, as a teacher, as a fashion designer, as an economist or an accountant, and then through role modeling. And this is what we do for our students. We can inspire them to show them what a living, breathing example of excellent scholarship would look like. But we can also then hopefully see Students will admire those characteristics. They will try to imitate that, and they will try to become like you, and they'll try to live like that. And in that way, they will just develop a set of virtues themselves. So <clears throat> we have different classes of virtues. And there's been a lot of discussion in philosophy about the virtues you need to be ethical. Some discussion on the virtues required to be a good citizen. And then in the last 30 years or so, a lot of discussion on intellectual virtues, or if you wish, epistemic virtues or the virtues to be good at science. So the first thing is not all of them are moral or ethical. For example, the virtue of endurance, not necessarily ethical. Um, so you get intellectual virtues, the ones relevant for teaching, that the ones that I've put together come from intellectual virtues. That is, you have a desire for truth, knowledge, and understanding, and those virtues guide you in the most reliable way to find truth, to get to knowledge and to acquire deeper understanding. Civil virtues, civic virtues are those that help you to become a model citizen. For example, the virtue of justice, the virtue of fairness. And then moral virtues 
are those that help you aim to live the good life. And all of these virtue, virtues embody motivational states. So all of them will drive you to do those things, to search for knowledge, to become a just and fair citizen, to live the good life. So how do we use them? We identify what are the salient features in the situation and we apply them wisely. We appreciate the situation and we then say, what is called for in this situation? This, this student has just notified me. I cannot submit my essay on time. I live in Zanspreit uh, informal settlement. I don't have reliable access to ele electricity, just the stolen version. I'm using somebody else's laptop. So the virtue of compassion, how are you going to deal with that situation appropriately? And then <clears throat> I absolutely must quote Aristotle's golden mean to you. Aristotle says, uh, for example, if, if you have anger and you become angry at someone or something, how should you deal with your anger? Aristotle would say, respond not too much, not too little. All of you know that when you're angry, you can easily respond in the wrong way. Respond at the right time, in the right amount, in the right way, for the right reason. So in a sense, um, virtues give you this ability to make refined judgments to get the Goldilocks response just right. So second last slide. What do virtues offer us? I think second last slide. They give us flexibility. They give us responsiveness, fitting responsiveness to situations. They enable us to develop continuously. How? They, they give us a self-correcting attitude. They help us to self-correct. They stimulate growth in us. They show us how to grow continuously. They empower us to work appropriately. And they focus our attention on doing those things that will lead to flourishing. So which virtues do we need for teaching? We need those virtues that are appropriate to partly definitive of that form of activity. So what is, what is definitive of university level teaching? I'm just saying, I think we must become this Boyerian scholar and which virtues will enable us to become that. So this is my real second last slide before I close. So I propose 10, a set of 10 categories of teaching virtues. And you can see I, I borrow and adapt from especially Jason Beer, brilliant virtue epistemologist, and also a recent book, 2021 book by King, Nathan King. So my claim is that these virtues will guide you and drive you to strive for excellent teaching. The first set that you need, the first kind that you need, is you need virtues to initiate and undertake inquiries like inquisitiveness, curiosity, wonder. You need virtues to help you make sufficient and proper, to help you focus sufficiently and properly. Attentiveness, careful observation, perceptiveness. To ensure consistency in evaluation, fairness or clarity. To guard your intellectual integrity, honesty, self-scrutiny, coherence. To enable your mental flexibility, you need creativity, imaginativeness, agility. To make challenges and risk taking possible, you need courage, for example. To make endurance possible, tenacity. To enable respectful treatment of other people, justice, fairness and respect. Virtues to empower you to show caring, patience, beneficence, empathy, 
last one to enable dialogue and collegiality you need respect attentiveness courage judiciousness fair mindedness so overview and conclusion the marathon athlete, I said, aims to be the ideal athlete, has specific tasks to complete, has a particular body, specific set of abilities, characteristics as enablers, and you, as a university lecturer, has a specific task to complete. You must aim to be the ideal academic, must have a particular mind, specific set of abilities and characteristics as in enablers. So I've shown you the ideal, the task, the agency you need, the abilities to be perfected, the virtues to be acquired. And if you combine them through smart work to become excellent at teaching, then you can empower yourself. You can become stronger, more confident to be better able to durably shape your own teaching to fit the higher standards. Just note one word in the last sentence, to durably shape your own teaching. So empowerment must be long lasting. That colleagues is it for references to my sources. See the reference list at the end of each chapter. And that is the book um, that has what I've given you as the main arguments. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you so Thank much, you. Prof. This was truly um, enlightening for me. I think maybe for all colleagues that are here as well, there's an interesting conversation going on in the chat while comments and some questions. So instead of just reading from these, because some are written really long, I'm going to allow colleagues to just speak to their comments and ask the questions. I'm going to start with UK. Uh, you can ask your question and the comment and Prof will respond and then we move to to other colleagues. Would that be fine? <clears throat> That's fine with me. I think me. I've, I've written too much that I forgot what I was asking. Um, <laughs> the first question you asked was any tips on how we cultivate agency? Yeah, I think that's probably my, my most um, Qu the, the question that I want to ask most, because I think it's good to know that we need to do all that, but how do we do it? I would really would love to hear some of your tips and suggestions. <clears throat> um, I'm going to switch on my camera when I ask, answer questions, just to make it slightly more personal. Um, the, there are two things that I think um, I could answer you with. The one is um, agency, um, is dependent on skill um, and it's dependent on, on how you use your talents, um, how you use your temperament, etc. So one part is, is to just engage in what I call deliberate practice. Um, so we could we could look at take take a, a very important um, example uh, to design on Blackboard. That's not easy. Um, you need a lot of skills and not a lot of, of software skills to be able to design on Blackboard. If, if you've seen the difference between uh, top class, uh, the most excellent Blackboard designs and what, what somebody like I would do, you will know how much skill is involved. So, so the, the, the point, I think the central thing is deliberate practice to, to try out things to get feedback to try again and that feedback could be from colleagues it could be from watching videos on blackboard design um, blackboard has enormous amount of of uh, help videos for instructors for example it could also be um, what i did for myself was to try to reverse engineer um, about two or three years ago i asked a few colleagues at uj i asked cat uh, please tell me who are the expert designers of teaching material on, on Blackboard at UJ. And I asked those colleagues, colleagues, can I please have a look at, at, at your Blackboard sites? And all of them very collegially said, 
colleague, uh, I'll give you access. You can have a look to reverse engineer. So, so you, you educate yourself, you look at what's possible, you practice, you get feedback on what you're doing, and you try again. I think that is that is the skills, temperament, talent part. Uh, obviously, research plays a major role. Um, also, scholarship of teaching and learning to get to read enough, to know enough what's going on, to know how things work. But then the virtues um, is very important as well. Um, to cultivate those virtues. Let, let, let's say you're not very accurate. Um, you forget a lot of things. To figure out what could be a way for me to improve my accuracy. Um, perhaps I must make notes. I must make notes of everything that I've got to do. Perhaps I must ask colleagues to give me feedback. Perhaps I must get a mentor with whom I can discuss these things. So, so um, coming from me, um, I'm a year away from retirement. You never stop learning. You never stop growing. You never stop developing. Um, and to have that kind of mindset overall, to say that that I must improve further, I must develop further. What can I do uh, to do so? What who can I ask to help me improve? I think that that's a few practical suggestions for you. Thank you, Prof. There is uh, Ingrid wrote something. Uh, he want. I mean, she wanted you to talk about uh, or query. She's querying your analogy of the marathon runner or super athlete. Uh, Ingrid, do you want to elaborate on your comment or question? Hi. Yes. Good afternoon. Thank you, Prof. Lata. I really enjoyed your reflection on the different virtues that that go to making up a a committed, deeply committed and dedicated academic. And it's nice that at the end of your your academic career, you're reflecting and actually passing your your years of knowledge and experience on to, to others. I just felt that the use of the super athlete was perhaps not the best analogy because to be a super athlete, you have to have been born with certain attributes, whereas I think to become an excellent academic, you, you have to have a deep commitment to your students and to, to I guess, a sense of social justice. Uh, and, and that can be developed. It doesn't, it doesn't, anybody can become a really good academic uh, if they are persevere enough and, as you say, apply the virtues that you speak of. Also, the, the role of an academic is multifaceted, whereas the role of, a, uh, uh, of an athlete is simply to become the best athlete. Maybe something like a, a master chef may have been a better analogy because they have, like we do, so many different facets to their, their profession and their, they need to, to nurture and develop so many different dimensions of themselves. Um, I mean, I'm sure that a super athlete does have to develop lots of other dimensions, but I, I just feel our job is so much more multitasked and multifaceted than a super athlete. So it was just a comment, but thank you so much for, for your insight and input and wisdom. The, the, the point of an analogy is, if, if you look at the meaning of analogy, there are certain overlaps are certain similarities and certain dissimilarities. So the the point of choo choosing the marathon athlete is to bring the similarities into sharp focus. Granted, and that's why I said um, to talk about excellence in, in um, teaching is highly contested, it's much more complex, etc. But but the the important uh, parallels and the important overlaps, uh, I think, was the reason why I chose that to to focus your attention because of the complexity of teaching, um, but to to help you to see through the mist and the fog of the complexity to see. But there is very important uh, set of of um, likenesses. And, and yeah, all of us are absolutely 
fortunate through luck. We've had the, we were born with the intellectual capacity to become university lecturers. Many people can't do it ever. So, so there's, there is that, that similarity. Um, so yeah, the, the, I, I think also the, the um, complexity shows, especially in how you measure teaching excellence. So you measure the marathon athletes excellence plain and simply in terms of, of the best time. Whereas in our case, it's, it's contested. What are the measures that you use and that's why I try to spell out the task. We've got this complex task and you've got to develop a set of measures, set of standards that gives due respect to the complexity of the task. But yeah, so it, it was for, for ease of understanding and ease of just uh, getting a clear focus on what I think are the core issues of teaching excellence. So I move on to Catherine's question. Catherine said, I'm very interested in the phenomenon of expert intuition, how it manifests in the educational space. Are there any texts that discuss how it develops better in individuals as com uh, in some individuals as others? Can one get better at thinking on one's feet in ways other than just accumulating experience? The the there's a um it, it's again um when I, when I look back on the process of writing the book, um, it was tremendously um, exciting, um, but also very busy in the last two, three months. Because one of the articles that I found also right towards the end was a new publication by a guy that wrote a lot on, on uh, skills development, a philosopher. Um, he he co-wrote this one with someone else, Matt. He is Matt Stichter, who co-wrote it with a female colleague uh, on this idea of expert intuition. And, and it's, it's, it's not just experience, um, it's sharpening your skills and it's, it's um, deepening your insight um, so that um, I'm thinking of a very good example now, uh, so, so that you can be much quicker in, in responding. I'll never forget, uh, I had a colleague in botany who, who always said years ago when I was, when I was young, he said, when I, when I give students uh, laboratory exercise to observe the cells of this plant through a microscope, in about five minutes they're done, seen everything there is to see. And it takes me a few days to do that. So, so as as you as you, it's, it's the same with with um, if you travel through the Karoo. Um, I've got a friend who's a paleontologist, and he he goes for field trips in the Karoo. Now, if you go through the Karoo, you might be aware of the heat, and you might be aware of the of the plains, and you might be aware of the semi-desert vegetation. But for him, he can immediately see, look at those geological ridges, look at those strata. We might find uh, fossils from that period 200 million years ago there. Uh, he can read it differently. And I think it's the, 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 the sharpening of your skills, uh, making turning them into real smart skills, deepening of your insights that will give you that ability to respond in, in the quickest possible way. Okay. Thank you. Then the next one is someone said we've got load shedding. Unfortunately, yes. Um, then someone says expert to intuition largely draws from repeated exposure and training on the sweet spots. Will that mean more exposure, longer teaching, and more reflection is the key? Um, yeah, it's, it means um, experience. It's, it's interesting, um, you might have heard when I said, it's not just about training, it's about smart training. Um, I, had a, I had a lecturer who taught me 
and a group of 95 other students and refused to give us notes. So we had to sit and write down. So what he didn't realize is that students smuggled a tape recorder into his classroom and taped his, his notes and transcribed it. So when I did his, his courses, I sat with the transcribed notes in front of me. And he even had his jokes written into his notes. And then, then the transcription had the jokes as well. So that kind of experience of teaching the same way every year is useless. It's, it's the kind of experience where you evaluate yourself. We ask the students to evaluate yourself. You ask a colleague in your discipline to evaluate yourself. You ask a colleague uh, from one of the support divisions to evaluate you, and you learn from, from constructive feedback and to develop those skills. In various ways, you, you can get that, that feedback to enable you to do what is called deliberate practice. And reflection, obviously, if, if you look at the way that if you'll read the book, you'll see as well the, how often uh, education researchers uh, talking about excellence will talk about um, reflection. There's, there's one that, that talks about a complex spiral of reflexive activity uh, being the key to teaching excellence. I can't remember the exact wording, but that is. I'm also curious how much one can draw from experience of teaching different topics, whether it can help cultivate with expert intuition, better teaching. I've taught in, I've taught different kinds of students. It was all philosophy, but I've taught students in philosophy, students in some of the human sciences, taught students in people management, taught students in zoology, taught engineering students. And indeed, it teaches you a lot to work with different kinds of students. Forget about uh, just the, we we'll all take it for granted, working with first years compared working with master's students. So all those kinds of experiences are enriching if you can draw on that experience, if you can make use of it, if you can reflect on it, if you're perceptive enough to look at a third year engineering student and say, wow, third year engineering student, you are a little professional, um, far removed in, in your self image and self confidence from my third year humanities students. Okay, comments, you can ask questions as well while I work through the comments. Someone says, thanks, this was truly empowering. I'm glad because uh, that was the aim of the book, to empower people. Um, someone says the ebook is available from a library. Someone, I believe, teaching different topics helps to cultivate expert tuition, particular teacher agency, obviously, to, to, to work with... Um, I, I, I taught students in the humanities and and to work with smart students who've been taught by smart lectures or master's students in business management faculty uh, to work it's, it's to work with those students it it really taught me a lot and and when when you read the book um, read the preface where I'm just playing with myself so besides saying that I wrote a book for myself, I wrote a book for my younger self to answer some of the questions I had, but also to tell my younger self, you should have asked these questions. But I also thank the students who taught me. And I, th I think it's, it's so important to be willing to learn from our students, to, to let them teach us certain things. Uh, to have that that awareness. Okay, then someone else says uh, the road to wisdom as virtues as milestones. Yes, I think so. But, but the the um, it took me it took me years to to really think virtue theory is worthwhile 
But I really think so at the moment. The one reason why it gives you this ability to make nuanced decisions and judgments, it gives you this ability to ask, how exactly must I respond in this case? What is exactly right, given all the considerations playing a role? Um, someone says Master Chef is a good um, suggestion. Um, it involves customer satisfaction. One one of the the parts of the book that I didn't touch on this morning is a discussion of the the explosive debate that erupted in the UK when the UK government introduced a teaching excellence framework that they enforced on the British academics. And part of it is, is some of those British academics just saying, don't use those consumerist terms of customer satisfaction, et cetera. Um, not denying that we should listen to students, but, but cautioning against the kind of vocabulary, the kind of ideological discourse being used. And then there's a question, any tips on keeping motivated? It's a function of the, I think it, it, it's, those of you who attended Catherine's um, talk on motivation, uh, VC award um, lecture, um, will see the link between uh, focusing on motivation and the idea that I, that I say, when, when I said, um, virtues embody motivational states. So if you're curious, you're going to be driven to find out. Um, if you wonder about things, that's going to drive you. So, so I think that's the important function of virtues, is to be motivational. So if I really care about my students, if I really think they are worthwhile human beings, I can play an important role to strengthen them, to empower them, to prepare them for life outside. If I have that kind of caring, it's going to drive me. So, so in a sense, um, I think to develop appropriate set of virtues. And someone else says, it's thought provoking. Thank you and congratulations on the launch of your book. Thank you so much. I think um, someone recently asked me, are we not going to have a book launch? said, no, nah, I think I'm going to treat this one as a book launch, so that's nice um, to share it with you. Um, yes, someone else says, close to 30 years in this space, reflective, so much, so much to build upon, so much to learn. That's the kind of attitude that we should have. We can never stop learning. Um, just imagine, for me, closer to the end of my career, having to uh, switch to online teaching and learning, try to master that, try to be in full control of online um, learning management system and design. Okay, there's another comment saying, experts are good at spotting patterns, so reduce cognitive load, to focus on emergent, emergent things. I think that comment um, cuts in different ways. I think what is important um, I can say this to you, colleagues, I've made so many mistakes uh, in terms of this work-life balance. Um, if you don't have proper work-life balance, what you lose, fast, productivity, creativity. And that's why it's important to take care of yourself like the athlete. The athlete must be in prime condition. You must train hard. But come race day, come competition day, you must be well rested so that you can fire on all cylinders. I think that's true of our minds as well, that we take proper care of our minds so that when we in front of students uh, in that kind of situation where we have smart students who can ask us difficult questions, we must be sharp. Adaptation to context is key, absolutely. Um, how I teach philosophy at first year level, honors level, differs. How you teach zoology 
and economics and mathematics attend to the context. And then, um, because I think part of what we must do is, is look at UJ's new teaching and learning policy, decide whether it's, in the book I talk about the, the uh, policies that can promote epistemic corruption or policies that are epistemically insensible. Um, the British academics are telling us they regard their teaching excellence framework as a policy that promotes epistemic corruption and it leads to epistemic vices in students. Um, so we must we must look at our policy, newly proposed revised teaching and learning policy. Does that policy promote the right kind of things in my context? Because we teach different things. Learning agility, indeed. Um, Someone says she'll read the book. Thank you so much. Then someone says we can take this time to reflect about our teaching. It's valuable to pause and reflect. It's much needed. Absolutely, we, mu we must have these kinds of conversations. Um, we must have a community of practice bigger than in our department, bigger than in our faculty. We must talk as university colleagues about the things that we share. So important. And then last comment saying the work-life balance is vital. Colleagues, any further comments or questions? Anything else you would like to say or ask? Can I just um, add something, Prof Lotta? It's Kibi. Um, I think uh, you know, I think you've you've just given us so much to think about, but um, unless we actually very intentional in the ways in which, and I think that's what that's what you've 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 actually demonstrated, you know, very intentional in the ways in which we we think about and reflect on our practice as teachers, um, you know, and 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 part of I think part of the, that intentionality for me as an academic staff developer is about creating the spaces to actually really interrogate our practices and engage um, you know, in, 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 in these kinds of conversations. So, so I'm really, really grateful that, that you've actually shared your insights on the book. Um, you know, that, and and I'm, sh I'm sure like me, everybody is really going to go out and read the book because there's so much you've, you've actually just tipped, you know, you've, you've wet our appetite. So I think there's just so much more that we really want to engage with. I mean, I certainly want to engage with the ideas around um, agency, you know, uh, because that's been my interest for a while. So, so I certainly want to engage with that. So, so thank you so much. But um, I'm not sure if there are any other comments. I'm actually taking over from from Angie as well because she's been uh, she's been affected by um, load shedding. So, I'm not sure if there are any other questions. Can I just respond to um, Kibe? I think it's a. Sure. It's a um, I must say, Dr. Naidu, um, congratulations on your PhD. Um, <laughs> um, let, let, let me just respond by saying two things. Um, it's actually one thing that's going to fall out into two. The, 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 the discussion in the first part of the book that I didn't touch on now, I refer to it just now, on the teaching ex excellence framework in the UK, um, the, the discussion is important because I had to look at the literature and say, what can we learn from this debate in the UK uh, about teaching excellence in universities and their experience? And what I then eventually said is that it seems to me their teaching excellence framework is a policy on teaching effectiveness or teaching efficiency. It's not about the teaching excellence of institutions. And then, then just almost just one page, I give my view on, on what would be 10 characteristics of an institution's teaching excellence. One of them is the role of support staff and division. And you'll see in my, in my preface as well that I thank the UJ support staff because 
um, that's a you're a crucial part. You were a crucial part in my own teaching development. You specifically, we had many conversations, often just in the passages, often in meetings. But but that is an important conversation to have. And your role as a support division is extremely important. And I was so impressed with the series of, of lectures that you presented this year um, to, to just enrich discussions on teaching. I think that is one of the characteristics of the teaching excellence of an institution. So well done to your whole division. Thank you. Thank you for that. And and I think it's but I think it's also testimony to to people like yourself and the other and, and the willingness of academic staff to really share and you know to invite debate and discussion. So I think that, you know, so um you know it is something that that it is it is present in the UJ culture around you know the importance of teaching and learning. But I certainly think that we do need to be very careful about how we balance things like teaching excellence that's prescribed from above. You know, um, how we engage with policy in ways that policy doesn't become something that's that's too restrictive that allows us to develop as agents you know, to develop our agency in that context. So, so I think it is quite a balancing act that we have to play, you know, um, you know, even nationally, we know that that there's a lot of discussions around what teaching excellence ought to be. And we have to be quite careful about how we engage with those as well and how we locate ourselves within those debates and discussions. So it's very easy to follow the kind of UK road route as well, where we get, you know, where there's very, you know, where we be, where it's very prescriptive, where they, you know, they're pre prescribed around how we uh, enact as teachers in this space as well. Can can I comment on that? Because <clears throat> I was I was fascinated by by um, again, it was one of the last readings I did before I had to submit the manuscript by one of the UK academics who said, okay. You've got this teaching excellence framework, but you know what? You're not going to pin me down. I can comply with your framework, plus do everything that I want to do. Now, that is agency in operation, saying that, that whatever the institutional policy might be or the larger government policy might be, I, I, I put it in this way, we academics hold the cards because we design the courses and we engage the students in the classrooms. So in that sense, I think the development of agency uh, is exceptionally important because in that way, we make policies our own and we add our own vision of what is excellent teaching in my field. We add that as well. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions for Prof Lotta? No. Uh, Prof Lotta, do you have any final words before we close? <laughs> I just want to say thank you. It's it's um, it's quite an important event for me. <clears throat> it's the first time that I've discussed these ideas um, at any kind of forum, um, and it's it's. It's kind of important. I've developed these ideas. I've published the book, and it's important to get feedback from you as colleagues to see how you react and respond. So, if any one of you have any um, suggestions, etc., any comments, send me an email. Um, <clears throat> I, I took a chance when I wrote the book. Um, I decided that after the last sentence. I would add my own sentence and say, if you want to share anything with me about your own teaching experience, uh, please email me at the following email address. And I gave my Gmail address so that it's not linked to UJ or my work at UJ. Um, so, so I would really like to get feedback from you on what you make, what you think, what you would do different. I, um, I would like to get your feedback. Even if you wanted to rip it apart, you're more than welcome to do so. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for so generously sharing your thoughts and ideas with us. Um, I want to say thank you to everybody else for joining us and thank you for your feedback and your comments. Um, 
and we look forward to seeing you in the next session that we host. Thank you very much. And thank you, Prof Lotto, once again. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone, and bye-bye. Bye-bye.